Module 6, The Child with a Communicable Disease. First of all, when we're talking about communicable diseases, we need to discuss infection prevention. We need to share with the family uh, different ways to help prevent the transmission of infection. Understand that as children age, they learn to share with their family and their playmates. And in the process, they often share infections. We need to teach these children to cover their mouth with tissue when coughing or sneezing. And make sure you throw those tissues into the trash and wash your hands after you sneeze or cough into your hands or a tissue. Teach them to cough into their sleeve at their elbow. And washing their hands after going to the bathroom coughing or blowing their nose once again. Never share partly eaten food. If a utensil falls on the floor, no, there's no five second rule. We need to wash it right away or get a new one. And don't eat any food that falls on the floor. Again, no five second rule. They should never drink from another person's cup and they should never share a toothbrush with someone else. Some of this is common sense to us, but the younger the child is, you know, this happens pretty often. The incidence of STIs is higher in the adolescents than any other age group. We do know that infants can also be infected with STIs, but this usually happens prenatally or during the birth process. If children are infected after the neonatal period, we need to consider that they are victims of sexual abuse until that has been disproved. Prevention is the most effective tool against STIs, and the only way to avoid STIs is to practice sexual abstinence. Condoms are going to provide protection, but they are not fail-safe. Adolescents have to be taught all aspects of consequences. Children are engaging in sexual behavior at a much younger age than they used to, so we need to be providing this education at younger and younger ages. Once again, the uh, different STIs that we're referring to, they're not the only ones, but they're the most prevalent ones, would be the human papillomavirus or HPV. It is the most common STI in adolescents. And remember, it's recommended that all males and females be immunized by the age of 11. 12 at the latest. Gonorrhea often goes undetected in females, so if they are sexually active, they may have an infection and not even be aware of it. And they're not aware of it until it does progress to a serious pelvic disorder. And it can cause sterility in males. These clients are not going to develop immunity to the organism, they can become reinfected. So again, making sure that all partners are treated because if they continue to have sexual uh, relations with particular people, if they're not treated, they're just going to reinfect the uh, person who was treated. Chlamydia infection has replaced gonorrhea as the most common and fastest spreading bacterial STI in the United States. Genital herpes has uh, reached epidemic proportions in the United States and probably is underreported. Syphilis is spread primarily by sexual contact and clinical manifestations would include those cardinal signs of the primary stage, uh, which is the canker, and it appears on the penis, the vulva, or the cervix, but can also appear on the mouth, lips, or rectal area. The secondary stage involves the rash, sore throat, fever. The latent period can pers persist for up to 20 years without any symptoms, and it does do damage in the body even though there are no symptoms. The tertiary stage 
they develop severe neurologic and cardiovascular damage, mental illness, and gastrointestinal disorders. And then HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. This is the one that causes the AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Transmission is caused by sharing of infected needles, exposure to infected body secretions through sexual contact from HIV positive woman to her unborn fetus or newborn, usually through the placenta. And if the birth process cont is contaminated with the mother's blood, they're more likely to contract the disease and breast milk. Clinical manifestations in infants and children, they're often asymptomatic, but they may exhibit the failure to thrive uh, phenomena, oral candidiasis, chronic diarrhea, and they may have developmental delays or have flu-like symptoms such as a fever. They might have a rash, a sore throat, enlarged spleen, lymphadenopathy, recurrent bacterial infections, and their CD4 count continues to drop. They may develop pneumocystitis, pneumonia, and the wasting syndrome the HIV encephalopathy and cytomegalovirus. Mono is also known as the kissing disease. It's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. It is transmitted through saliva, which is why it's called the kissing disease. There are no immunizations available for this process. Adolescents and young adults are going to be the most susceptible to the virus. Clinical manifestations include a variety of symptoms, including a mild to uh, severe symptom. They may have a fever, a sore throat with enlarged tonsils, thick white membrane that covers the tonsils, palatine petechiae, swollen lymph nodes, enlargement of the spleen, extreme fatigue, lack of energy, headache, abdominal pain, and epistaxis. Again, there's no cure for it. Treatment will be based on the symptoms and may include analgesics or antipyretics, definitely fluids, soft bland diet if that throat is involved, corticosteroids, bed rest, and avoiding contact sports uh, for the simple fact that if they do have the enlarged spleen, it could potentially cause a rupture. As nurses, we need to encourage precautions to avoid secondary infections. In other words, practice infection control. Encourage the child to express their feelings about interruption in school, social life, and their work plans. Yeah, this process, they may be put on bed rest, and that can be very frustrating for kids. They have the desire to be active, but yet that just increases the duration of their symptoms. Various diseases were expected historically uh, in children, and some of those diseases include measles, the mumps, whooping cough, diphtheria, chickenpox, mumps, polio, and several others. Um, but now with immunizations, we just do not see these communicable diseases that often. You need to look in your textbook on table 41.3. And this is going to provide a list of various communicable diseases that we've seen historically, how to prevent them, the symptoms that they're going to have, and the different treatments that are involved. I'm not going to go into specifics here because that's all laid out very well in your textbook. It is important though to follow the guidelines of the CDC regarding standard and transmission-based precautions and you can find those specifically uh, 
laid out in the Appendix A. And always follow the procedure manuals of your facility or institution to prevent, prevent the transmission of infections. Some of these communicable diseases may just have a temporary or transient effect on the uh, child, but some of them can have lifelong issues if they're not cared for appropriately. Question, true or false? A young woman who is HIV AIDS positive delivers a child and wants to breastfeed. As with all new mothers, breastfeeding should be encouraged. This is false. Remember with HIV, uh, this can be transmitted through the breast milk. So we definitely do not want to encourage breastfeeding with HIV positive mothers. Conjunctivitis is a significant uh, eye infection that happens, very, very contagious. It is an acute inflammation of the conjunctiva. It can be caused by a virus, by a bacteria, by allergies or a foreign body, but most often by bacteria. Uh, cultures can be done if there's any exudate coming from the eye to help identify the organism. And we treat it with ophthalmic antibacterial agents. And we have to, have to, have to teach appropriate precautions to prevent this from being spread. You know, if a child rubs their eyes and then they touch something, that bacteria can then easily be picked up by the person that follows them and they rub their eyes and now they are infected. Also, when you're cleaning the crust from the eyes with warm compresses, making sure that you're always using uh, a different cloth or a different part of the cloth. So if one eye is not infected, you're not transmitting that infection to the other eye. These antibacterial medications can be provided through eye drops. And frequently we will use those during the day because ointments can cause blurring of vision. So we save the ointments for nighttime. Acute nasopharyngitis or the common cold is one of the most common infections of the childhood. It is viral in order origin and it can be caused by rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, coxsackie viruses, respiratory syn uh, the RSV virus, uh, influenza viruses, parainfluenza viruses, and the adenovirus. Bacterial invasion, you know, just because you are sick with a virus doesn't mean that you might not get a bacterial infection. Uh, it kind of knocks down our immune system and makes us more susceptible to catching bacterial infections. Uh, these bacterial infections can cause ear, mastoid, and lung infections. Prevention is vital. You know, we can transmit this to other people so easily, and especially when it's children because they just do not understand or comprehend the importance of appropriate infection control. So frequent hand washing. Don't touch your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. If you do, then you need to go wash your hands, making sure that you're using soap and you're washing your hands appropriately. As far as manifestations, infants often will develop a fever with a common cold. They may have difficulty eating because infants are not natural mouth breathers, and if they get the nasal congestion, then they can develop respiratory distress very, very easily. Older children, of course, they, they also have the nasal congestion, but they're able to breathe through their mouth much easier than infants are. They may have discharge with sneezing and coughing, 
fever is less common the older we get. They may have a headache, decreased appetite, or difficulty sleeping. Often the difficulty sleeping is because you can't breathe or because you're coughing. Diagnosis, we need to just make sure that this is not something else. Uh, again, complications can include otitis media and sinusitis. Treatment involves uncomplicated, uh, or if there is no complications, it just involves rest. Increasing fluids, making sure the child is getting appropriate nutrition, may require nose drops to help open up the nasal passages. Suctioning, especially in children that are unable to blow their nose and remove that uh, mucus. Cool mist humidified environment. We want to make sure that the environment stays moist, uh, humid, because that will help keep the secretions moist. They're much easier to get rid of if they're thin and moist. If they dry up and become thick and sticky, then they can be very difficult to get rid of. We can also administer acetaminophen or ibuprofen. We never give aspirin to a child under the age of six because they have the risk of developing what we call the RISE syndrome. Cold cream can be uh, placed on the upper lip or petroleum jelly might be uh, might be good to help relieve any irritation from that nasal drainage. Gastroenteritis. A lot of times this involves an infectious diarrhea that's caused by contaminated food or human or fecal waste through the oral fecal route. Organisms that might cause this infection would be salmonella, E. coli, shigellosis, or the rotaviruses. Infection precautions are necessary and you know sometimes it can be really difficult to determine what that causative organism was. Clinical manifestations might be mild where they have the diarrhea stools 2 to 12 a day. The child might be irritable, have a loss of appetite, may have the mild or moderate diarrhea that can quickly become severe. Vomiting might accompany these infections, might cause large losses of body water and electrolytes, their skin gets extremely dry, begins to lose turgor. With the infants, the fontanelle will become depressed or sunken. They have a weak and rapid pulse. Stools might be green in color and be more liquid and might be blood tinged. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we diagnose? Well, you need to get a stool specimen and send it for culture. Uh, and also, do they have a temperature? We need to help prevent any potential complications of diarrhea, making sure these kids stay well hydrated, that we're replacing fluid and electrolytes, uh, replacing through oral hydration preferably, but IV hydration if necessary, and medications as directed. Always talk to the family caregivers and encourage them to call the care provider if the child develops a sudden high temperature, they have severe stomach pain, the diarrhea becomes bloody, more frequent or severe, or the child becomes dehydrated. In the child, we look at dehydration as not urinating for six hours or more, not having any tears when they cry, their uh, mouth gets very dry or sticky to touch, their eyes become sunken and actually dark circles around their eyes. They become very uh, much less active. So all of these would be indicators for us to call the healthcare provider. And now ready for your post-test.